we're ready to introduce conditional probability. This is a super important concept, and it plays a really important role in inference and decision making and all sorts of applications of probability. The problem is it's often very counterintuitive, and so it's really important for us to rely on the formal mathematical definitions, at least at first. So let's think about some motivations. Let's say um, I've designed a system that can send out radar signals and uh, observe them. And so I see a certain radar signature and I want to know how likely it is that an aircraft is actually approaching. Or maybe I have designed a test for a disease and it comes back positive. What is the actual likelihood the patient has the disease? Finally, let's say I take a set of structural integrity readings and I want to assess what is the probability that the bridge that I've measured fails in five years. Okay, to get started, let's work out a really simple example that we can just do with our intuition. Uh, we're going to roll a six-sided die, and I'm going to tell you that the outcome was even. So what is the probability that the outcome was actually a four? Well, intuitively, we can guess that the probability of seeing a four given that the outcome is even, that's going to be one third. Okay, this is the right answer. And why did we say that? Well, unpacking it a bit, there are now three possible even outcomes and all outcomes were equally likely. So four is just one of those three outcomes. So the probability of seeing a four given that we saw the rule is even is one third. Okay, and I used this conditional probability notation here that we haven't yet introduced. But what if the outcomes are not equally likely? This is where our intuition kind of breaks down. And to handle that, we're gonna introduce the formal definition. So the conditional probability of event A, given that event B occurs, so the way that we denote that is with this probability of A with this vertical slash then B, that's the event we're conditioning on. So the mathematical formula for that is probability of A given B is the probability of the intersection of AB divided by the probability of B. This is super important. So really worth um, kind of committing this formula to memory. Remember that B can only occur if it has positive probability. And for B, probability of B zero, the conditional probability of A given B is undefined, all right? Because we're dividing by zero, it doesn't make sense. So we only define the conditional probability when we know that the B has a positive probability of occurring. Okay, so what's the intuition here? Well, conditioning on the event B is like restricting the universe of possible outcomes to only those in B. So we now know that B has occurred, so the universe shrinks to only have outcomes that are actually in B. So given B, the only outcomes in A that can occur are those in A intersect B, all right? Because those outside A intersect B cannot occur because they're parts of A that are not in B anymore. So if originally I had the whole sample space and I had the set A and the set B, and then I condition on B, what happens, my universe now shrinks down, B now plays the role of the sample space, and the only part of A that can occur is the part of A that's inside B, okay? That is what conditioning means. And the reason we divide by the probability of B in this formula is to renormalize the probability so it totals one, because probability always have to add up to one. So we're now thinking about a new universe in which B is playing the role of the sample space. Okay, let's go back to the simple example and let's see how the formula works there, okay? So we're just gonna, we know the answer is supposed to be one third of seeing four out of an even roll, but let's work it out formally. Okay, so what we wanna know is the probability of the event A, which in this case is just the probability of seeing four, given the event B, which in this case is that the roll is even. So I told you the roll is even. So let's unpack the rule is even. So it's four given 
two, four, six. All right. And the definition of conditional probability says that this is the set four intersected with the set two, four, six divided by the probability um, of two, four, or six occurring. And using additivity, we can kind of unpack this. On the top, all we're going to have is the probability of four. That's all that's left from the intersection. On the bottom, we're going to have probability of two plus probability of four plus probability of six because those don't overlap. So we're free to add up their probabilities. Um, this is just a simple uh, six-sided die. So each uh, outcome has probability one-sixth. We just plug those in. And what we're going to get is a sixth over a half, and that's simply a third. Okay, and that makes sense. This was easy for us to compute intuitively because it's a special case, okay? So it is, um, you know, a conditional probability question, but it is the easy case that occurs when all outcomes are equally likely. This is where our intuition is actually fine. When the outcomes are equally likely, and I ask you about conditional probability, you can just compute it by saying it's the number of outcomes in the intersection of A and B divided by the number of outcomes in B. And that's what we intuitively did. We said that four is just one outcome and that there are three even outcomes, so it's just one third. And this only works if there's a finite number of outcomes, but in those special cases where things are equally likely, you can use this formula. Otherwise, you have to be careful. Okay, all of the axioms and properties for conditional probability can be derived just from those from probability. So it's just another kind of probability measure. Um, so we can just reuse those axioms as we had them. So non-negativity still applies. Probability of A given B has to be greater than or equal to zero. Normalization still applies. So the probability of the sample space given B is the probability of B given B because that's just sample space intersected with B, and that has to be one. Um, countable additivity. So if you give me a collection or a countable collection, A1, A2, and so on, of mutually exclusive events, then if you try to take the probability of their union, given B, you can just add up their probabilities of those events given B. These are the basic axioms of probability, but I've just conditioned each of them on B because they also apply to conditional probability. I also get the complement. So the probability of A complement given B is one minus the probability of A given B. And inclusion exclusion still applies. I'm gonna introduce C as well here. So I'm gonna have the probability of A union B given C, since I need three events for this to make sense. That's going to be the probability of A given C plus the probability of B given C minus the intersection probability of A and B given C. Okay. There are three techniques we need to remember when dealing with conditional probability to help with calculations. The first is the multiplication rule. So if you have events A1, A2 up to AN, and you want to know the probability of their intersection, you can multiply conditional probabilities in the following way. Probability of A1 times the probability of A2 given A1 times the probability of all the way up to AN given the intersection of A1 up to AN minus 1. Okay, so that's a lot to look at. We're going to look at a simpler case to build intuition. Remember, this is always assuming that the thing we're conditioning on has positive probability so that the conditional probability makes sense and we're not dividing by zero. So the special case is easier to think about. So if you have two events A and B, when I write the probability of the intersection, I could write it as probability of A times the probability of B given A. That's the multiplication rule. You could also write this in the other order, probability of B times the probability of A given B. And you can check for yourself that this makes sense because the probability of A given B is just the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. And so those probabilities of B's cancel from the numerator and denominator, okay? And in general, you can write this out in any order. The order A1, A2 up to AN is just for the convenience of writing it down, but it could be in any order. Let's work out an example. So in this example, you're going to draw three consecutive playing cards from a standard 52 card deck. 
you're not going to replace them between draws, what's the probability that the three cards that you get are all hearts? Okay, a little bit of notation. Let's say the AI is the event that the ith card is a heart. Well, one out of four cards is a heart. So the probability of A1 is 13 out of 52 because there are 52 cards, 13 is a fourth of 52. So I'm just writing 13 out of 52. So we know that there are 13 hearts in this deck. Once I have the first heart, the number of hearts goes down from 13 to 12 and the number of total cards goes down from 52 to 51. So the conditional probability of getting the second heart, given that I already have the first, is 12 over 51. And the conditional probability of getting the third heart, given that I already have the first and second heart, is 11 over 50. Because I've taken out two of those hearts already, there are only 11 left, I've taken two cards out from the total of 52, so I only have 50 left. If I want to know the probability of getting all three cards hearts, that's A1 intersected with A2 intersected with A3, and the multiplication rule tells me I can get that from the probability of A1 times the probability of A2 given A1 times the probability of A3 given A1 intersect A2. And as we just calculated using a little bit of intuition, it's just 13 over 52 times 12 over 51 times 11 um, over 50, and a little bit of simplification gets us 11 over 850. Okay. The second technique we need to remember is the law of total probability. So let's say you have a partition, a set of events that form a partition. Let's say B1, B2, and so on. And let's say each of these events has positive probability. So those are the assumptions we need. And then I can write the probability of a different event A as the sum of the conditional probabilities of A given these events B1 up to um, B2 and so on, times the probabilities of those events, okay? So this is like um, the multiplication rule, but each one of these uh, components is just capturing a piece of A, and we'll see why this works. So, um, so look at each term. Probability of A given BI times the probability of BI, that's just the probability of A intersect BI by the multiplication rule we just learned. And if I sum up these probabilities, which is what the law of total probability is telling me to do, so that's like summing up the probability of these intersections, and by additivity, this is like the probability of the unions of these intersections. And the reason I can do that is since these form a partition, I know that they don't overlap, so I can use additivity. And since they cover the whole space, I know that I have to end up covering all of A. Okay, so visually is a lot easier to see what's going on. Let's write B1, B2, B3, and B4 to cover this whole space. Okay, and let's say that A just stretches out some, in some way over all of them. Okay, so what's going on is I'm just capturing with each um, term a part of A. So there's the part of A that's over B1, the part of A that's over B2, and so on. I'm just adding up all those probabilities. And Although it's kind of hard to see from this abstraction, there are cases where this is a lot more convenient than anything else in terms of doing the computation. Finally, let's look at Bayes' rule. So Bayes' rule is a third technique we need to remember, and it's a technique to flip conditioning. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you want to know the probability of B given A, and you have the probability of A given B. This equality is not true in general. What you need to do is reweight it by the probability of B divided by the probability of A. This is the way to flip conditioning. So if you want to change the order of conditioning from B given A to A given B, this is how you have to do it. Why is that true? Well, the probability of A given B times the probability of B is the probability of A intersect B, and the probability of B given A is the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of A, and that's just the definition of conditional probability. So you can just group these terms and see that we're just writing the definition of conditional probability um, in a different way. The main thing I want you to remember from this, even if you don't remember the formula, is that in general, the probability of A given B is not equal to the probability of B given A, okay? That's the main thing I want you to remember. And then if you remember that, 
Whenever you see that you need to flip conditioning, you know you need to look for some kind of trick. Finally, you can combine this with the law of total probability. Let's say you have a partition, and what you want to know is the probability of one element of that partition, let's say b sub j, given a. And what you have are the probabilities of a given b sub j. We can just multiply by, um, you know, as Bayes' rules is telling you to do. So this is exactly just Bayes' rule. And how do I get the probability of A? Well, I can expand out the probability of A using the law of total probability, using the individual terms that I already have. So that's just a technique that's sometimes used um, in conjunction with Bayes' rule.